In today's video, we're going to talk about the social inequality case study, Jabatin Basai in Jakarta. This is for the OCR A-level spec, where you need to have two contrasting places and look at it from the fact that social inequality impacts people and places in different ways. So I've circled here where Jabat and Basai uh, is in Jakarta, which is in Indonesia. It's a slum that is just northwest of the city centre. And the slum has come about largely due to the fact that there is a lack of affordable housing. This is caused by the fact that Jakarta is a huge draw for migrants. It's a place of industrialization and economic boom in Indonesia. Um, and therefore, the government and private sector can't actually keep up with the demand for housing. They don't have the resources to do it. And so slums have been the natural consequence uh, because of this. Uh, this is the area of Jabat and Basai. It's a very small area, only half a kilometre, and it's very densely packed in terms of housing and population. Over 31,000 people living in that half a kilometre. Uh, it's a place that has... Um, uh, developed a, a community. It's an organic settlement that has happened over 40 years. It's kind of grown up, so it's made of people that have lived there for a couple of generations, but also new migrants who are joining the city. Despite it being a very poor area, uh, there's a, a good, strong sense of community, uh, and there are very resilient people who are trying to make the best out of the opportunities available to them. We can see here on the left, it's also uh, next to the Kiliwang River, um, which is going to play a part later on. I'm going to talk about housing conditions. Uh, because of that lack of affordable housing, um, people have had to often build their own houses. What we often find on the ground floor is that the housing is, uh, the original house is actually built of timber or brick, which is of a, a reasonable quality. But because of the uh, a lack of space and the need for, for more people to live in this area, Extra stories have been added, and often these are added. Um, they are made from scrap metal and wood, made by the residents themselves, and therefore aren't very well made and very makeshift. We have further problems in the fact that because they are makeshift accommodation, often informal, they don't have uh, amenities plugged in, so electricity and sanitation. We see that's a problem here because often kerosene has to be used in homes for lighting and cooking, and therefore kerosene as a fuel is a uh, a high chance of creating a fire. We often we see here on the other arrow that there is uh, electrical uh, supplies that have been tapped into. These are often uh, jumped into by the, the residents and because it's again done informally they're often not very well um, put in place, but not by experts and, and they often overload uh, the circuit breakers. This again can lead to sparks being thrown and therefore fires occurring. In a, in a densely packed area where most of the, uh, the accommodation is made of scrap materials, if I've got this kerosene and then the potential for overloading by electrics, I'm obviously going to get fires occurring. And when the houses are so densely packed together, this is where fires occur very, very rapidly. This is an actual fire that happened in Jakarta a couple of years ago. In terms of the social economic conditions. Indonesia is a, a, an EDC, it's getting richer, but there is large equality um, in the country. The, the wealthiest individuals that live in Jakarta um, would own about 30% of the resources and that would be the top 10%. This um, reflects the whole of Indonesia and so people in Jakarta and Basai would be the poorest 10% uh, and they would only have access to a small amount of resources. So this seems to affect lots of the other areas of conditions and the inequality within um, both Jakarta and the, the slum compared to the rest of the city. When we look at um, Jabat and Besai, most of the employment would be in the informal sector. Uh, this is small businesses that are not regulated by the government, lots of self-employment, often service-based, so selling food or selling textiles. And uh, because it's informal, the, these are very vulnerable jobs that therefore people don't know how much money they might, will make day to day. Uh, this is something that is across the whole Jakarta economy and nearly 60% of the, of the entire economy of Jakarta is informal. When, when the, there is not guaranteed sources of income, uh, people will go to any means to make income, not just selling services. But here we can see that people have actually salvaged um, kind of materials from waste tips and they're selling those on a second hand goods. Uh, because, because this work is very informal and vulnerable and, and there's no regular guaranteed income, people often 
in these areas make four dollars or less a day uh, often in casual unskilled work there is some formal work um, the formal work normally comes in the form of the garment industry um, and in Japan BSI there is small scale producers uh, this would be about 10 or 12 people would be working or making textiles in a, a small factory all in one room because of this they're not very regulated very well which means the conditions are crowded there's not very much health and safety and the workers have very few rights employment rights um, or you know rights to kind of sick pay and so the conditions of these people isn't much better than having an informal job. I'm going to look at health conditions one of the things you find in Japan and Besai is the fact there are very few toilets the only toilets that are there are often run uh, by small companies that are trying to make profit unfortunately most of these toilets are actually uh, flush their waste into the streets or the local river and because of this this is where we get a deterioration of health when that human waste mixes with the drinking water we often get uh, diseases like cholera and typhoid starting to spread when people consume that water and there isn't very much clean water actually available in and Basai and so people are often drinking supplies that are contaminated through the waste that is being dumped. There is um, some groundwater, uh, but unfortunately, Japan Basai is actually built on a former waste tip. And so if people do have the money to be able to access groundwater through wells or pumps, it's often polluted. Therefore, people are often going to get um, ill uh, from the conditions that they're, and the water they're actually getting from this groundwater. Jakarta is in a hot and humid area. Uh, to a tropical temperate zone and because of that it's the perfect um, breeding sites for uh, mosquitoes which produce malaria so this is another threat to the people living in this slum because of the climate conditions we talked about kerosene earlier on kerosene is a, it's a major source of uh, air pollution people are using it in their homes for cooking and lighting and the actual fumes can cause uh, diseases like lung disease or bronchitis which um, again, another health problem, but also the fact is that it's just a, a large source of pollution in the slums. As we, I said earlier on, Jakarta is a, a country that is developing and there's lots of industrialization, lots of factories. And so the people in the slum are also subject to the wider air pollution that is coming across from um, other parts of the city and the winds bring it into Jabat and Besai. So multiple sources of pollution. Therefore, the health standards of these people are quite low. This is backed up by the fact that people don't have very great diets due to that, that poor uh, and irregular income. The diet is on, often based around rice. Um, and there are very little opportunities for vegetables and protein that get into the slums. And this is also, again, that lack of income feeds into the education of the younger people. The schools are very poorly equipped um, and a lot of the children end up in the informal sector because their parents can't afford for them not to be working. So young girls often end up in the garment sector, again working in these very, very poor conditions in small scale produced factories. The, the Jakartan government has tried to make some changes. So they have actually tried to identify 392 units in slums, which are trying to improve. We can see on the right here, this is a, a slum that has been improved in South Jakarta. And what they've actually tried to do there is they've uh, cleared slums. They've tried to upgrade buildings uh, by using bricks rather than the kind of corrugated iron or wood, but also starting to install key services and amenities. So proper sanitation, running water. The, the only problem uh, with this is it's obviously very expensive with the Jakartan government doesn't have a lot of money to actually fund this. But also when you start to clear slums, what actually happens is those slum residents simply move to another slum. And we're seeing that happening with the slum clearances in Jakarta. So the, the Kilowang River slums are uh, the one in this picture here. They're extremely bad. And they have uh, lots of the problems has been that people have moved from other slums to there when they've had their slum cleared. So there is improvements trying to be made. But obviously there is still a huge amount of inequality within Jakarta, but also the inequality between people living in Jabat and Besai and people living in other parts of the world, especially AC countries.